Okay, I think we are live now. Okay, welcome uh, and thank you for agreeing to do this again so early and we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, you you have two hours to use as you feel see fit, whether, you know, to, if you feel less is more, that's fine. If uh, you want to stop for discussions or a break, that's also great. Uh, so with that in mind, please take it away. And uh, Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great to actually um, be here and talk to you um, over Zoom. Um, so I, I, I want to thank you and uh, the organizers for just putting this together. I can't imagine how to, how to toggle six times. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, so yeah, we, um, I'm very happy to, um, to be here and tell you about, I decided to talk about FACTA since I have two hours and I thought um, this might be a topic of, of interest. You might have heard about FACTA or you might not. This has become um, one of the, 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 the active topics uh, in the past, I would say five to six years. Um, so if you heard people talking about it, you might be wondering, what is it all about? Because it's, uh, it's, um, it takes some time to, to fully explain uh, why people get excited and how people are exactly um, working on it in, excitedly. Um, so, so I thought, well, since I have two hours, so I will just uh, try to uh, give a more, um, a, a, a slower pace. Uh, introduction to the topic um, and then try to give you a background of um, how this came up and what people are doing and, and what we are doing uh, on the topic. So I, I realized there must be a, um, experts in the audience because I heard of questions about FRACTA already <laughs> just now. Um, but um, but um, I, uh, I wouldn't assume uh, that people are familiar with the topic because because this is um, relatively new and also relatively uh, niche, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's not one of the experimentally motivated questions, so it may um, stay that way. But I think it's a very exciting direction which, which combines um, quantum information, condensed matter, and also higher energy uh, now. So I thought it's a perfect topic for, uh, for this workshop. Um, yeah, so... So I think I will, um, um, also, sorry, let me share my screen. I decided to, to use um, um, my iPad and then I can write on it. And then of course I will welcome all questions and please interrupt me at all time. And that actually makes me feel more alive. Uh, if, um, if I give Zoom talk and, and I don't see anybody, I don't talk to anybody, um, I, I feel that, <laughs> but if somebody interrupt me, I'll feel more alive and, um, and I'll, I'll try to address all questions that it comes up and we can be flexible. We can uh, take a break in the middle uh, and then continue and see how much we, we get to. Sounds good? Okay, okay, great. Okay, so let me see. Right, so here I'm giving, um, I listed a rough outline of what I want to talk about, um, but uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll talk about more, maybe we'll talk about less, um, and either is okay. And uh, again, um, I'll be very happy to address any questions. So don't feel, don't hesitate to, to, to stop me because sometimes I just gloss things over. Um, but I think as the, the organizer pointed out, I would rather use the time to actually fully explain something that you might have heard about and always had had questions about uh, and think that will be um, a great outcome for this talk actually. Okay, so um, so I want to, uh, you see my outline here, it's like, I want to give an introduction of what it is. It's a, it's a made up word, uh, <laughs> fractal, not fraction, but fractal is a made up word. And um, so by itself, it didn't, may not mean much. And it's a, it's a word that actually, the community debated a lot. At, at the beginning, we tried to 
replace the word with something else, but nothing stick. <laughs> it turns out fractal is the one, and that's very catchy, um, and then people liked. So so it stick, but the other the downside is that it didn't mean that much, and sometimes it can be a little um, confusing because it sounds like it's related to fractal. It is, uh, but not every fractal is related to fractal. So I'll try to just explain what is the word trying to refer to and why people are, uh, how, how we got into this topic and um, uh, what it is about. Then I'll try to just throw out some examples. I think it's best illustrated by, by toy models and by examples um, what fractal is. Um, uh, and then I'll try to give a, a more general introduction to what people are doing Naturally, there's a, a wide range of things uh, that people are working on uh, on fractal. And of course, depends on where you come from and what you care about. But it turns out that um, this, these kind of systems are special and weird in a lot of ways. So that's why uh, there are a lot of activities uh, on these models, not just, and sometimes unrelated activities uh, on these models. So, um, so, um, so I'll try to um, be broad-minded and try to give you a taste of what could be happening. Of course, it, it, uh, there are a lot of things I don't know. Uh, this field is expanding very quickly. So uh, if I miss something, um, sorry about that. And, uh, and if you uh, I know something that I missed that's important, please just let me know. Uh, and then, uh, so section four is something I call foliation. Again, it's another word. Um, and it's something we have been doing. Let me try to toggle this. Okay. Um, on fractal, and I'll try to explain why we think foliation, the mathematical idea of foliation is related to, to fractal and finally uh, given outlook. Okay, so here I've listed two papers and these are two review papers on fractals. Uh, one is by Nan Shur and Mike Hermeli. Uh, the other is um, Michael Preko, me and uh, Yi Zhi, you. Uh, oh, I'm sure they are published, but uh, I just lost the archive number for convenience. All right, so let me just jump into it. Okay, um, so I should say that the, the history of um, uh, of fractal goes way back, and well, of course, it's just in hindsight that we would say that because the word literally was uh, invented around I think 2014, 2015. Um, but now, on hindsight, we would say that people have been working on these examples, these models, uh, for much longer time without calling it a name. Um, because the models have shown up in different contexts. Um, but at that time, it didn't, I guess it didn't become a thing. <laughs> it's uh, one model here and one model there. Um, but what actually um, led to the, the, um, the invention of this word and, and the starting of the field, uh, I would say it's, um, in a, to a large extent, it's the study of so-called uh, self-correcting quantum memory. Uh, in quantum information. So this is a long word, self-correcting quantum memory. And what it means is, actually I would like to call it a quantum hard drive because it is a hard drive. And this is what people were trying to do. They were, people were asking, um, so if we have a quantum computer, let's say we have a quantum computer and we want to have a hard drive. How can we have a hard drive? How do we build a hard drive? It turns out to be extremely hard, even until nowadays, uh, we don't know of a, a very um, good way, even theoretically, uh, how, to, how to build a quantum hard drive. You might find it um, surprising because, well, theoretically, we know how to do quantum computation. We already know how to take information, manipulate it, and, and, um, and, and do something highly non-trivial and then uh, read the output. But on the other hand, we can't even do storage. And that's weird, right? It sounds like storage should be lower bar than computation, but actually it's not. 
because what you do with computation is that you put it in a in a, um, a dilution fridge and then you put vacuum on it and then you constantly run error correction codes on your quantum computer and that's a very essential step in the full computation scheme okay if you want to achieve so-called for tolerance quantum computation you want to run error correction code on it all the time. Otherwise, the computation will break down uh, very quickly. Um, but the hope with a hard drive, as with all the hard drive we have at our home, not quantum, but classical, we want a hard drive to not be connected to power source all the time. And we want to be able to just ha have a chunk of hard drive and then write information into it and then carry it with us or put it in your drawer for a long time and then come back to read off uh, the information. So in a way, uh, we want the information to be protected uh, in a passive way without active error correction. This is why we, we call it a self-correcting, meaning that we're not correcting it. <laughs> the, the, the system is correcting it itself. Um, but that's a very high bar. Uh, it turns out to find the kind of um, quantum system uh, that allows so-called self-correction um, is, is extremely hard. Um, well, so self-correction sounds like the system is doing anything, but actually it's just that the system has certain property that allows you to protect the encoded information in an intrinsic way. If you think about what happens with the hard drive we have nowadays with us, the classical hard drive, it's just a magnetic disk, right? And information is encoded. <clears throat> information is encoded into the magnetic domains. If you have all the, the magnets pointing up, it's logical zero. If you have all the magnets pointing down, it's a logical one. And that works perfectly. Uh, it, if you encode information in this way, you can store the information without cracking it for a very long time. And then afterwards, once you plug it into the computer, you can reliably uh, read it off. Um, but then from there, uh, we, can, we can try to understand why quantum hard drive uh, is hard. So, so to briefly just <clears throat> explain why classical hard drive works. Now let me draw this picture. <clears throat> of little magnets. And if you think about it, the very, one very important thing about these uh, magnetic domain is that they're two dimensional. Because if it's two dimensional, uh, then let's say at some point an error happens. An error happens where you flip one of the little magnets from up to down. And then there will be error made. So this little magnet <clears throat> will have higher energy, will high, have higher dipole-dipole interaction energy with all its nearest neighbors. You can see my screen. Okay, good. Um, and then what can happen is that more magnets can flip and the error region might grow. So let's say this is your domain and your error region grows to, to something bigger. And then the error it makes with the surrounding will also be bigger. And basically it, it expands as the domain wall between the error region and the outside region. And the domain wall in a two dimensional magnetic disk is something that grows bigger as the more error happens. And that's very, very, very important because that's how we keep the error under control. So if, um, so if you think about it, what people don't do is that we don't have magnetic strip. And we don't use magnetic strip uh, to store information. And there's a very good reason for that because if we, have a, if we have a magnetic strip and if we make errors, um, there will be two domain walls. But the thing with the strip is that as you make more errors, there will always be two domain walls. So the energy cost, the yeah. error it makes, sorry. Um, so the error it makes and the energy cost doesn't grow uh, with the expansion uh, of the error region. And that's why one dimensional magnetic strip is not good for storing information, but rather we need two dimensional domains 
um, to store information. And basically what people are looking for is that we want uh, the energy cost to grow, to grow with, uh, with error. So here you see that um, in the two-dimensional magnetic disk, the energy grows at square root. Okay, this is square root of uh, the error region. Well, in one dimension, it doesn't grow at all. It's just a constant two. And it turns out that um, because energy cost grows, so the storage time uh, can be exponentially long in the size of the domain, in the linear size of the domain. And that is a very important rule uh, in information storage that if the energy cost keeps growing, then it gets harder and harder to keep expanding the error region. So the error region will, under, will be under control and eventually you can, you can correct for these small errors. But if the error region grows too big, you lose control and you can't correct for it anymore. Okay. So this is why uh, we need two-dimensional magnetic disk to store information. And this is also why uh, storing quantum information can be so hard. Okay, because if you think about it, in a classical world, the information is stored as zero and one. And all we need to do is to prevent zero being flipped to one and one being flipped to zero. And that's what we call a, a bit flip. Right? Bit flip is the basic kind of error that can happen in a classical storage. But once you go to quantum information, quantum hard drive, now information is not just bit, it's a qubit. So in, uh, we can have a qubit of zero being flipped to a qubit of one. But at the same time, we also need to worry about what's called a, a phase flip. That if we have zero plus one, it can be flipped into uh, zero minus one. And that's bad because that's a very, that's uh, that, a, a kind of quantum error that we don't want because zero plus one and zero minus one are also orthogonal to each other. So it changes the quantum information completely. Um, so if we want to store quantum information, we not only need to correct for the bit flip between zero and one, we also need to correct for the phase errors, um, like zero plus one to zero minus one. And that's what makes it extremely hard. It turns out basically that's the two kind of error that we need to correct, but just because we have one more error to correct, instead of just needing a two-dimensional system to be able to, 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 to store the information, now we need two dimension uh, plus two dimension equals four dimension. And by four, I mean spatial dimension. We need four spatial dimension to do this. And that's crazy because we don't live in a four dimension, four spatial dimension world. We live in a three spatial dimension world, right? So there are actually four spatial dimensional uh, toy models, which you can show that supports quantum hard drive. Basically the idea is that you use two dimension for the bit flip error, such that um, the error expands with a domain wall and you use the other two dimension for the for the phase error where the um, error also expands with a domain wall. But then when you add them up, it's you need at least you need four spatial dimension to do this in the most straightforward way. So that's not that's kind of not good <laughs> because as toy model is okay, but if you really try to make it into a, an experiment or a device. Uh, this is not very realistic. So for a long time, um, people in quantum information know this problem and they were trying to ask, can we do this in three dimension or lower? In three spatial dimension or lower. And that would be, that would be great. 
Um, but um, um, yes. Oh, hi. Sorry, I'm not, I realize I'm not in the camera. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, so it, it kind of sounded like what you were saying in the classical case was very closely related to the presence of um, symmetry breaking. It, it sounded like there's a close correspondence between symmetry, classical symmetry breaking and, and the presence of the classical hard drive. It, is the same true in the quantum case? Yeah, great question. So indeed, uh, so in classical world, we use symmetry breaking uh, yeah. for this hard drive, but in the quantum case, we cannot. Uh, we need something like topological order. At least it turns out topological order is not enough either. Um, but um, but that's because symmetry breaking is eventually uh, this bit flip, right? Uh, it's like one configuration mapped to the other configuration, but there's no coherence between. Um, we usually don't, don't make use of these. Uh, we can't make use of these coherence because coherence in the classical hard drive. If you think about, let's say, quantum icing model with symmetry breaking, it turns out that the bit flip requires a big operation to implement. But the phase flip, you can just act on one of the magnets, one of the little spins to implement a phase flip. So, um, so this is, I think, generic for symmetry breaking order in that um, one part of the um, error correction is uh, one, one part of the error is hard to happen, but the other type of error is very easy to happen. So, so symmetry breaking is in general not good uh, for quantum hard drive. And um, yeah, so, so people, people in error correction, um, of course, they have been thinking about this and that's why people come up with this idea of uh, topological uh, codes because in topological codes, both kinds of error are kind of hard, both the bit flip and phase flip errors. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Can I also uh, ask a, a question? So why does it have to be a phase flip? I mean, you could phase, you could also, there could be an error which infinitesimally moves the phase away from. Sorry, you're saying that we can uh, continuously rotate the, the yeah. phase, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's yes, exactly. an error which, which kind of drifts the phase uh, as, you, as you move uh, spatially. And actually, so my understanding is that you are arguing how uh, storing quantum information classically would need for spatial dimension, right? But uh, I think maybe it's even worse because if you try to just store a phase via symmetry breaking argument, in two dimensions, you couldn't do it because of Merman Wagner theorem uh, classically, right? Oh, uh, I, oh I, I, uh, sorry. So I need to make it clear. So when I say quantum hard drive, I mean storing quantum information in a quantum medium. Right. Without, so, yeah, reading, uh, without measuring it, without reading it. Right. So it, it was your argument, because I, I don't think I understand completely the argument why we need four spatial dimensions. I was under the impression that the argument is kind of in with the analogy of the classical storage. So maybe I could buy it that you need four spatial dimensions to store quantum information on a classical computer, but uh, uh, I, I don't fully understand why you, what, is it obvious that you really need, uh, well, could you elaborate on, on why we need four Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, I was I being hand waving, uh, yeah, just trying to talk abstractly, but sure, of course, I can um, go in more details. So, 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 as I um, first, I need to clarify that this is storing quantum information in a quantum medium, without reading off the components and trying to store the components as classical bits on a classical hard drive. And actually, if you read it off, I think you just if you read it off the amplitudes they of a qubit and you just store the, the amplitude individually in your uh, classical hard drive and, and that's fine. And that you can just use a, a, a regular hard drive. It's just two different pieces of information, right? But here it's storing a quantum bit in a quantum medium without reading it. So that it, it, didn't, it, it hadn't collapsed. It's still a, a coherent wave function. And then later on, you can still keep on manipulating it. You can you can do computation with it. You don't have to reconstruct the wave functions from the classical amplitude uh, that you have read off, okay? And so, um, so maybe it will, be, it will become more clear once I say uh, what this toy model is, what people have in mind that could um, be a legitimate quantum hard drive, even though it's for spatial dimension, 
Now this, this is one of the four dimensional toric code. I don't know if that makes things better or not, but maybe for uh, some people, um, sorry, not toric coder, toric code. One of the 40 toric codes such that, such that the logical operator, um, so the toric code has some ground state degeneracy and you can encode your information in the ground subspace an operator that maps from, that do some rotation on the uh, ground subspace that does logical operation on the ground subspace, they are membrane operators. Membrane. Logical. Operators. So this is in a sense similar to what happens in a, in a magnetic disk. In magnetic disk, if you want to create error, and uh, you have to implement in a, in a disk way, right? So that's a, what we call a membrane operator. So similarly, in this 40 toric code, we also have membrane operator, but of course we have one for each, one for uh, the bit flip error and the one for the, the, the face flip error. Um, and and in, in the, somehow in the quantum world, you can't just do them parallel. You have to use extra spatial dimension to do them. Does that answer your question? Sorry, I had to wheel to the computer to unmute. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I guess uh, I understand now the point. So, so your point is that there is there is a model where you can solve the, the memory storage quantum mechanically, but it's the most straightforward one is in four spatial dimensions. This is what you're saying. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the, the, the pursuit, yeah. The pursuit to find um, models in three spatial dimension and lower to do this uh, actually led to frac time, even though without solving this, this quantum hard drive problem. Okay. But it's, it's, not, great, uh, yeah. it's not, uh, a kind of a theorem uh, with some assumptions that it, you need for spatial dimension. It's just the most straightforward way to do it. Yeah, I would say that in four spatial dimension, we know that it can be done. In two spatial dimension, people pretty much believe that we cannot do it. We cannot do it in two spatial dimension. So that leaves three spatial dimension open. Uh, so they're having a lot of work on three dimensional models. And you see that a lot of fractons are, are discovered in, in, in three spatial dimension, even though after all these efforts, it's still very open how to most, how to, how to do quantum power driving. Uh, in a straightforward and reliable way uh, using a reasonably uh, physical model. So she, she I'm sorry, okay. uh, and maybe you're gonna answer this later, but my, my, what is the physical restriction you have to have on your system for it to be a quantum I mean, so, so you're saying that you have to go to four yeah. dimension, but what, uh, what condition are you putting yeah. on it that requires you to go to four dimension? Uh, yeah. Just as a Great physical. question, yes, 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 sure. I should have made that clear. So I am a theorist. <laughs> so for me, um, what I would require on a quantum system to be legitimate is just any local interacting model. I uh, like interacting, not interacting model. Of course, not interacting model, I don't think it can do it. So any locally interacting model with whatever interaction form. Well, I, I, um, I meant more in terms of the error correction. I mean, if you just take a single bit by itself, I mean, that in principle can store the quantum information, but obviously you, you don't want it to be just single. You want it to be an extensive system because of some reason of quantum error correction. So I'm just wondering, can you quantify what that condition is? Yes, great. Right. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so as you said, a single bit is not good because a single bit can easily be corrupt. Um, a single operation can change information. So we somehow want to store the information in a non-local way, such that uh, local errors cannot corrupt the information, but that's only one side of things. So let me write it down. So first, we need to encode, encode non-locally, meaning that information is hidden uh, in some non-local uh, Hilbert space that you cannot just change the information by doing a single bit flip or something like that. Um, but then secondly, uh, we need more than that. We need 
well, I would just say that we need this membrane logical operator. We're actually, sorry, I shouldn't say that because. Um, um, we need, um, let me think of how to say it um, best. Okay, so let me write this and I'll explain. Okay, so on the one hand, we need to encode information non-locally. And this is, this. these people know how to achieve it. This is basically the whole idea behind this topological uh, error correction, right? So let's say you have a two-dimensional toric code or some, some other topological order. And then you have a degenerate Hilbert space. You have a degenerate ground space. And you can encode your information in a degenerate ground space. And then what people know is that um, the information is encoded topologically, meaning that there's no local way. You can just do things locally to change the information. You somehow have to do some global operation uh, to change the information. But, but in, a, in a usual two-dimensional or even higher dimensional topological order, the kind of non-local operation you implement to change the information is what we call a string operator, that you do something along a string. Usually you create a pair of anion and then you, you separate them apart and, and wind around the non-trivial cycle. And that's the kind of logical operation and that allows you to change the encoded uh, quantum information. You can do it this way, you can do it that way, and it gives you uh, the bit flip or uh, phase flip. But that's not good because, um, so because this is in some way like um, the magnetic strip, right? Because as you implement the string operator, let's say you only implement it partially, what happens is that you create a pair of anion, you separate them apart, that's like creating a pair of domain wall and separate them apart. So, so these string operators, um, when you implement them, there's no energy barrier. Um, in the process, you create finite energy, and then the whole process just requires that finite energy. And because of that, once the anions are created, let's say the environment does that, then they can do random work without requiring more energy input to the system. So, so, so it will do random work. And because it does random work, it will take polynomial time for the anions to traverse the system uh, and annihilate with each other. So, um, so at best, uh, these kind of system can store information uh, for a polynomially long time. As compared to the, hard, to the hard drive, the classical hard drive, which can store information for a time that's exponentially long uh, in the size of the, the memory. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a system that can store information for an exponentially long time. Okay, so, so what people realize is that um, these topological codes, they're good if you have error correction, but if you don't allow error correction, if you don't allow active error correction, they're not good enough. And that's why people are looking for a system which on top of encoding the information on locally, will, on top of that, we also have an energy or uh, entropy barrier. Uh, to the propagation of error. So either you have um, uh, a high energy barrier to go, go across, like in all these um, um, uh, membrane operator with, with uh, loop boundaries, they have an energy barrier to go over if you want the error to, to propagate. Or people are also thinking about ways to make it entropically hard, um, meaning that there's somehow a very large um, Middle energy area that sorry, and then the, the system will get lost and um, and can't implement a logical operation very effectively. So, so of course, one simple rule people are using is that there shouldn't be any so called string operator, no string operator. String operator meaning something like uh, in, on the picture I'm drawing here, that you create a pair of anion and separate them apart and then wind them. And those are implemented with string operators. So first of all, people are looking for a uh, system with no string operator. Of course, that's just a, a necessary condition. And then you need to look for 
uh, energy and entropic barrier. Uh, and then maybe that kind of system will be will perform better uh, as a storage. Can I ask a question, Jean? Sure. The, the, this story about having two anions and, and them sort of moving all the way around, the energy required to do that can be exponentially large in the system size. Is, is that right? Oh. It's not right. Um, usually not, because we're talking about so-called deconfined uh, topological phase. Deconfined meaning that once the anions are separated at a certain distance, they don't feel the presence of each other. Uh, they okay. don't have interaction with each other and they can move anywhere. I see, so the only price you pay is the gap to make the anions in the first place, and that's just not, not yes. big enough. I see, thank you. Yes, exactly, yeah. So if you have confined topological order, uh, the bad thing is that you don't have a, a degenerate ground space anymore. <laughs> so, so either way, it, it doesn't work straightforwardly with this topological order with anions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so, so exactly, this is uh, these questions naturally led to um, what I'm going to talk about as the uh, as the sorry, I'm looking at my outline. Uh, as, as the, the type of uh, example, uh, which um, try to solve this problem, right? Um, people understood that now we're looking at three spatial dimensional models and we're looking at, we're looking for models which encode information now locally, but also uh, have an energy or entropic barrier. Or the, the first order of business is to find three spatial dimensional models with no string operator. And that's not easy because all the previous three-dimensional topological model um, we know, they have string operators. Think about all the, uh, the, the discrete gauge theories uh, that we know. Uh, there's a point gauge charge and the point gauge charge is, a, is an anion. Well, it's not a two-dimensional anion, it's a quasi-particle. And then you create them in pairs and then they move around and then eventually they will wind around the three-dimensional system and come back and annihilate with each other. So any of those regular conventional three-dimensional topological order uh, does not work, okay? But unlike two dimension, which is proven that, in, in a sense proven that pretty much everything is these kind of topological order, in three dimension is not proven, so it's more open. And it took some courage uh, of a graduate student <laughs> at Caltech uh, to venture into uh, the open world of three-dimensional uh, so-called stabilizer codes um, to find uh, some new model which nobody knew before. Okay, so let me uh, let me jump into the example section. Can, can I ask a question first about these uh, 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 string uh, operators and, and the the defects? So you you always mention that they. The defects, uh, you know, wind around and annihilate each other. But in a real qubit, you would not have periodic boundaries, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Great question. So yes. So so of course these are <laughs> the theorists' uh, imagination that you put things on torus and then you wind them around. So in real world, of course, what people do is that. Um, uh, let me draw it here. That if let's say what people propose for the so-called surface code or other kind of topological code uh, is that you punch holes uh, mm -hmm. uh, inside your code. You, you, you punch oh, holes yeah. and the holes are like um, open boundary conditions for the code. Right, and right. then you can tunnel anions um, between them. And that's like, mm -hmm. in a sense, uh, winding them around because you can do it this way and you can do it this way. Right, right, right. Yeah. But then if you, that's what have, if you just stay with the open boundary conditions and no holes, then the topological defects have to go out at the boundaries, right? They both have to fly out. That's yeah. how but you don't have a, any degeneracy then, I guess, right? So Yeah, you don't have degeneracy if you, so you just need have a, a right, solid right. disk. Right, yeah. right. You, need, right. you need boundaries. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. OK. Um, Right, so let me just uh, jump into uh, the exciting discovery um, by Joe and Ha. Um, and, and that caught people's attention. And 
and somehow became um, one of the reasons that we have the field of fractal today. This is called Haas code. Okay, so uh, Joe was a, was a graduate student at Caltech at the time, and he was in a uh, John Pascal school. And, uh, and they were talking about this problem of how to build a quantum hard drive and potentially in three dimension, you might be able to find it, but nobody had any idea. So, so Joe, I'm being a, a mathematically inclined uh, a student. So he said, well, let's just do a computer search. So he went back, he said, um, let, let me set up a cubic lattice in three dimension, put some qubits on it, and then search through the kind of stabilizer code. Uh, that you can you can realize on this cubic lattice, and uh, and he did, and he searched through um, a bunch of stabilizers. So of course, stabilizers meaning that you have this kind of a uh, Hamiltonian term, which is tensor product of poly x, poly y, poly z. And he started from simpler Hamiltonians and then get to bigger Hamiltonian terms. So as I said, we are we are simple minded theorists, so we don't care about how big the interaction get to, as long as it's finite, it can get big. <laughs> so, so he found some very exotic Hamiltonian, which amazingly he was able to, to prove, of course, that's the condition he put into his search, that, that the model doesn't have string operator. Okay. And then before that, people didn't know such kind of model can exist, but he found not just one, he found the several models. Um, such that there is a, uh, so in some sense, topological ground state degeneracy, uh, but then the logical operators are not string operators. And for his model, he was able to prove, he was able to show uh, that the logical operator actually has a fractal structure, a fractal structure. So let me tell you what his model looks like and briefly tell you why it looks, uh, why, why the, the logical operator looks like a fractal. So this is, of course, a um, three-dimensional cubic lattice like this. And then he put two qubits on each lattice side, two qubits. Every lattice side has two qubits. So every lattice side has a four-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay. Uh, and then uh, he, he designed some Hamiltonian terms. And the first Hamiltonian term looked like this. So when I write i, it means I, the identity operator on the qubit. And when I write z, it means the poly z operator on the qubit. And that's it. And um, so, so you see that among the 16 qubits around a cube, this Hamiltonian has, this Hamiltonian term has eight of them. Uh, being identity and eight of them being Z. So this is like an eight body interaction among eight qubits around the cube. Okay, it's pretty big. It's eight body, um, but it's okay uh, for Joe one. Uh, and so, so this is only one type of the Hamiltonian. There's another type also around the cube. And it looks quite similar, except that it's made up of poly X, not a poly Z. Oops, sorry. So Shia, your Hamiltonian is a product of all of these terms? Yes, is, it's a tensor product. product. Tensor product, and then you sum, of all, of, you sum of all the cubes in the lattice. Yes. And let me put a minus sign. You sum over all the cubes. Uh, and, 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 right. Yeah. I'm not done yet here, okay. Good, so this is the Hamiltonian term. So for every cube, there are two terms and then you sum over all the cubes. Uh, and every, every, every term is eight body, if you count it. Um, yeah, and that's it, okay. So it's complicated, but well, mathematically it's, it's still a local term. Uh, strongly interacting, and um, and the amazing thing uh, that that we are able to say anything about this model uh, is that all the Hamiltonian terms commute. Um, not just the term at the same cube, but the term at even neighboring cube. They touch each other at different locations, and even in that case, all the Hamiltonian terms commute. Of course, that's 
um, the requirement of stabilizer code. Um, and that made the model exactly solvable. You can calculate a bunch of properties of this model. Okay. Um, yeah, and so all the Hamiltonian terms being uh, commute with each other means that you can we can have the eigenspace being the common eigenspace of each of the term, and in particular, the ground space will be the eigenvalue one subspace uh, of all the Hamiltonian terms. And you can try to calculate how big is that ground space. And that ground space will be the space where you can encode your quantum information. Okay? And it's how the game is played with all these topological codes. Uh, so Joe set out to, to calculate uh, the ground state degeneracy. And it turns out to be extremely complicated. So let me try to copy the formula just to scare you, not to, <laughs> not to give any uh, useful information. And so let's say if the ground state degeneracy ratted as two to the k, so people say that they're k logical qubits, and then it follows this kind of formula, k plus two divided by four equals, I'll try to be quick and maybe not get all the details correct, but just to show you how complicated it looks. Okay. May have made a mistake of where this might be a square. Uh, so don't quote me on the details of the of the formula. So, the, but, but Joan was amazing. He was able to figure all this out. So you see that this is super complicated and it's not usually the, the kind of ground state degeneracy formula we have for a condensed matter system. Right? Usually for a condensed matter system, we either have no ground state degeneracy or we have some finite ground state degeneracy. And this is a calculation, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is calculation done on a three-dimensional torus. So it's very simple periodic boundary condition uh, in three directions. Uh, yet the ground state degeneracy looks hugely complicated. And this is already indicating that something weird is going on. And I was never able to make sense of the part of the formula, except uh, for one piece of information that, um, um, so it, it turns out uh, that if the system size um, is of some special number, for example, if it's the power of two plus one, then the ground state degeneracy is uh, is um, is some some small number. But um, if the system size is power of two, then the ground state degeneracy actually can be very big. Okay, so you see that k is k is linearly related to l. And the total ground state degeneracy is two to the k. So the total ground state, the, the, the dimension of the Hilbert space of the ground space will be exponentially big in L. And that's a very, very big ground state degeneracy. Usually we don't have that. Usually we have a finite ground state degeneracy, some number, four or eight or five. Um, but here it goes up uh, with system size. Okay, that's pretty much the, the only information I, I learned from this formula. And turns out that's an upper bound uh, on the ground state degeneracy. So if you plot the ground state degeneracy, if you plot K uh, with respect to L, it's a crazy function, but it turns out that there's, a, there's some linear upper bound. And, but beyond that upper bound, the dots can be anywhere. It's, it can, can go up and down, up and, and it goes crazy but there's a linear upper bound there. Okay, great. So this is the ground state degeneracy. Uh, uh, and then, um, so maybe let me um, just finish talking about Haas code uh, and then we can take a, a quick break and then come back. Does that sound good? Yeah, okay. Um, and then Joel went on to look at the excitations. And, um, and it turns out uh, that excitations in this model 
are made in a very different way uh, compared to the usual topological order. Usually in topological order, we create a pair of anion uh, at the same time. But here, excitations are created four at a time. So if you apply some, some, some operation in sigma x or sigma z um, error, four of the cubes will now have higher energy. This is just how the algebra works out. So if you act on the middle qubit, four of the neighboring cubes will now have error. Sorry if it's, this is messy drawing, but uh, if you can see what I'm drawing, among the eight cubes around the, the site, around the qubit, four of them will have uh, higher energy and the four uh, will sit on the corner of a tetrahedron. This is very, very special, what it's called. So if I um, just, just um, draw the location of the cube that have higher energy and connect them, I will have a tetrahedron. So instead of having a pair of anion, and then I can separate them, in this model, excitations are created four at a time, and they sit at the corner of a tetrahedron. And that makes all the difference. Because now you cannot, if you cannot just take one of them and move away because there's no two particle process. If you take one particle, move it away, that requires a two particle process. But here, all the elementary process involve four particles. And that's basically why individually, um, those errors got stuck and they cannot move freely anymore. And the only way you can try to move them is by stacking uh, these tetrahedrons. So you can imagine how you stack tetrahedrons. You have one tetrahedron and you stuck, stuck another one. And then you stuck another one. And then one more. Hmm. Am I doing a bad job drawing this? I could be. Sorry, the, the green one and the red one should touch each other. And the blue one. Okay. So when you stack these tetrahedron together, they, they touch each other and um, and where the tetrahedron touch, the excitation goes away because these are the Z2 excitation. You flip it up, you flip it down, okay? When two tetrahedrons touch, the excitation disappear. And when you stack them like this, uh, the, the arrows goes from here to here, to here, to here. So originally it's around the black tetrahedron, but when you stack four of the tetrahedron together, uh, they move further away from each other and form a bigger tetrahedron. And now they have separation by the unit of two. And then you can keep doing this. You can keep take this four tetrahedron structure and further stack it. And then the separation will become distance four. And then it becomes distance eight and then become distance 16. And then eventually you can imagine that when you stack enough tetrahedron, um, this become a fractal structure. Okay. I'm not good at drawing stacking tetrahedron, but I can try to draw how to stack triangles. It's conceptually very similar and it's much easier to draw. So this is the Sierpinski triangle. You can stack three triangles like this and then stack, stack three structures like that and then just keep going. Mm. And as we all know, this eventually become <clears throat> a fractal structure. OK. 
Okay, so potatohedron is very similar, except it's three dimensions, so I can't draw very nicely. Right, so this is why excitations in a hard code is very different from a topological model. Uh, they don't move on themselves. And if you want to separate them, you have to go through this fractal structure. And this is just saying that the, the logical operators in this model all have fractal shape. And there's, and Joanne was able to prove that there's actually no string operator in this model. And that's a, a big success. Okay, um, so I think this might be a good time to uh, take a break. And maybe we can come back in 10 minutes. Is that good? Okay, that's, that's great. Uh, I just had a, a very short question, you know, or maybe sure. we can discuss it after the break, but I was just wondering if it's possible to say whether this model is a good quantum memory, and if not, then why not uh, something like that? Yeah, so the short answer is it's still not good enough. Uh, it turns out that it's, it's fractal shaped, so you can imagine that it's still not a, a membrane shaped uh, logical operator, and if you want to... Um, Sorry, excuse me. It turns out the energy barrier you have to go through uh, in order to implement a fractal shaped logical operator like this. And then you can cut it at some intermediate point and try to calculate how much energy it costs. It turns out the cost only scales logarithmically uh, with the size of the system. And logarithmic scaling is not finite, but it's not much better than, <laughs> it's uh, much worse than the linear scaling uh, that we usually have in a classical hard drive. So, so people did, well, Joanne did a um, numerical study on uh, how good a quantum memory it is. And from the finite size numerical study, it seems that the storage time uh, is finite given uh, temperature of the system, but it doesn't increase indefinitely with system size. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question. Okay, okay sure. so. We mm -hmm. take a break and then 10 minutes, 10. Okay, and, we'll come and, back at uh, uh, eight past the hour. Yeah, I don't know, uh, I know. I don't know a way to stop live streaming. So please make sure you're mm -hmm. muted, uh, everyone. Okay. Uh, I don't know a, a way to pause it. So. <laughs> okay.
Aishi, uh, did you want to start? Or you know what, what are people came back? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, can you see me? Sorry, my computer went out of power, so I'm using my iPad right now. Um, so can you see me or see my screen? See something like you're sharing your screen. Yeah, we see your iPad screen. Okay, okay. Can you see my video? Yes, yes we can. Uh, I can't see myself. I think you can maybe can see yourself simultaneously. Oh my, I'm here. Oh. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll just stop my video, just um, save some power. Uh, it's also fine. Okay, so I'll just share my screen and I can still see you. Um, right, okay, my computer is, is completely dead. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let me know when I should start again. I think you, you can start, I mean, it's, it's been... Okay, I think so. okay, cool. So I'll try to, um, let, let me do one more thing. I'll try to connect to my, your bug so I hear more clearly. Uh, all right, yeah, thanks for coming back. Uh, and I really appreciate all the questions. Um, and um, so, um, so, so I just uh, introduced to you uh, this Haas code, and if, um, um, if you ask people in um, doing fra fracton, I think this is probably one of the most uh, famous models. This is one of the most surprising because nobody expected a fractal structure to appear uh, in a regular condensed matter lattice model, and and the fact that the point excitation don't move. This is so much against everything we know because, because usually we have the picture that, well, if, for example, if, if either in a metal or, or insulator, there's some quasi particle, uh, sorry, there's some particle uh, that moves or even in a, um, a Fermi liquid, there's some quasi particle that moves. And then going to these topological models, we always had a picture of particle moving but here the particle don't move. And that's um, a very shocking thing to know. And so people do talk about things like uh, many body localization uh, where, um, where you, you add a, a very big uh, disorder to the system, you add random potential something, and then the particles can get trapped. And then that leads to many body localization uh, but in this model, there's no disorder at all. Everything's translation invariant. So I'm talking about a completely translation invariant Hamiltonian like this. And I'm not varying the, the parameter in any way. Um, and, um, and yet, just because intrinsically, these particles don't move. Uh, so we have, in some sense, uh, a localization phenomena that individually the particle don't move. And that leads to all the dynamical consequences. For example, um, the, the thermalization will be slower and at low energy, the particles don't, don't bump into each other as much. And there's in some sense a, a localization phenomenon, although it's not the usual uh, localization that we know about because this is localization. If you have, if, if you have the quasi particles separated far away from each other, if you have a lot of quasi particles, then and if they're not separated far away from each other, uh, then they can get into groups. And once they get into groups of four, they can move. Okay, so the localization in this model 
uh, heavily depend on the fact that quasi particles are separated far away from each other. And this is why the localization happens in this model uh, only at finite energy, not at finite uh, energy density. And that's a, that's a big difference from the usual many body localization that we talk about. Usually we, we talk about many body, many body localization at finite temperature or a finite energy density. But for these kind of fractal models, um, this is at finite energy. Okay. But in any case, uh, this is um, um, this is one of the ways uh, that you can try to go beyond uh, the usual topological order and actually have something uh, with no string operator. So that's a, a, a big step. And even until nowadays, I think physically, we still don't yet have a very good understanding of what's going on in this model as in terms of how physicists try to internalize uh, this phenomena and try to feel that we understand. Although understand is a very objective word, but um, but but to a lot of physicists, I think for kind of smarter people, this one still feels like it's weird, it's exotic. Uh, and, and it's just it, what it is. And so you can calculate a lot of things for this model. But physically, it's just still uh, very much a surprise uh, in a condensed matter sense. That way, we definitely don't have a picture of how to include it in the general framework of, let's say, phase and phase transitions. Okay. Um, so this is uh, what people nowadays would refer to as uh, type two fractal model. Um, and, um, and by type two, uh, what people are referring to is usually this kind of fractal structure. Um, once you, when you want to separate the, the excitations far away from each other. Um, and this was discovered um, around 2010, 2011. Oops, 2011, uh, when Joe Wen was a, a graduate student. And at that time, the model was a big surprise, but people were like, especially condensed matter people were like, this is so exotic. Um, what can we say about it? Uh, and I, I particularly felt like that. I remember having a conversation with Joe and then I said, what do we know about this model? And Joe asked me, what do you want to know? <laughs> so of course, if I ask him specific uh, questions about the model, he can calculate it. He had given me an answer like the ground state degeneracy. But of course the question is how do we physically uh, interpret that, right? Um, so of course for this model, I would say it's still pretty much the, the case. But on the other hand, uh, later on, there were new models being discovered. And those are what people nowadays refer to as the type one model. And the type one model, looks much nicer, looks closer to um, our usual condensed matter setting our picture of what's going on. And that those are the models that actually uh, generated the, the fractal field. And, and now condensed matter people are getting into the topic and working very actively on it. So let me try to give you an example of what's called the type one fractal model and in particular this so-called X cube model. And this is one uh, Zhou Wen uh, went to MIT for Papalato Fellow and he worked with Liang Fu and Saka Vijay, maybe in different order, those three people and Ha. Okay, so they came up with some new models which are not good for quantum memory because these models will have string operator. They do have string operator. So it's a, I guess that's why Joanne was not looking at them at the first place, in the first place. But then in 2014 and 2015, when, when he um, started working with Liang Fu and Vijay, um, they came up with these model because they're still very, very exotic uh, from a condensed matter perspective. Okay. So let me try to introduce to you the x cube model. OK, 
Okay. Um. Right. Okay. So this XQ model, uh, it, it's again on cubic lattice, and then uh, the qubits are now on the edges. Okay, they're not at vertices, uh, they're on edges. And the Hamiltonian is like this. So when I write X, it's a, a poly sigma X. Okay, good. So for each cube, uh, there's a term that involves all 12 X around the cube. So it's even bigger uh, instead of just having a body. Oh, eight body, eight body, eight body, eight body. It's now 12 body. Um, and this is one term. And the other term is at the vertex involving the four sigma Z. And the total Hamiltonian, of course, is a is a sum of everything. And of course, the, the Hamiltonian is designed in a way that um, in a way that all the terms commute with each other, and this is a stabilizer because the Hamiltonians are tensor product of x and z. Uh, and everything commutes, so you can exactly solve it. You can count the ground state degeneracy, so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. And um, and um, for example, you can ask, what's the ground state degeneracy? And the ground state degeneracy uh, now looks like this. Okay. So it's two to the power of two Lx plus two Ly plus two Lz minus three. Well, Lx, Ly, Lz are the linear size of the system in x, y, and z directions. So, so you see that again, this is very big. This is not a finite number. It grows with system size, but it grows with system size in a much more regular way. Remember for Haas code, it is a crazy function like that. But in uh, for x cubed, the ground state degeneracy is at an exponential of a simple, of a very simple linear function of system size in all three directions. Okay. So it inherits, it, it has a similar um, non-trivialness, but non-trivial in a, in a much regular way. Okay. And then we can talk about excitations. Excitation. So as I mentioned, uh, in this model, Sorry, they're not. Question. Yes. Uh, so, the, are the, uh, is there a relative coupling between the two terms in principle? Can you still solve it or is it, is it fixed? Is it only solvable for a fixed coupling? If terms commute, then you should be able to solve it for any value. Yeah, the terms commute. Are you asking about the, the coefficients? Yeah, so in, in principle, you have some coefficients, right? Right, right. And yeah, uh, I'm being sloppy here. Uh, yeah, in principle, you have coefficients, but all these terms commute. So if you only care about the ground space, uh, and then as long as the coefficients are positive, uh, the ground space are the same. Uh, I, well, what confuses me is, oh no, uh, sorry. I, 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 um, so the, the ground states don't depend on this. Okay, okay, thank you. As long as they're positive. If they're negative, it's more tricky, but. Yeah, if they're positive and everything's fine. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so, so as I mentioned, there are now uh, string operators and let me color code these. The string operators uh, can act like this, for example, and have a, a string of X. I can just act a sigma X on a string of them and then um, this string will violate the blue term here, the blue term here, and also the red term here and the red term here. And similarly, if I have a string of X, 
along this direction, it will violate the green term here, the green term here, and the red term here, and the red term here. And finally, if I have vertical, I will violate blue term, blue term, and green term, and green term. So these are very much like in topological order where you create a pair of excitation and you separate them apart, right? So this is, this is a model that's not good for quantum memory, but it's still weird uh, from uh, Arcanine's matter, a topological perspective. Um, but these fractional excitations now created in this way with this string operator is actually very, very different from what we usually consider uh, as quasi-particle in the topological order, because if you think about it, um, if we create excitation this way and we try to make it turn, it wouldn't turn because it wouldn't turn in the usual way because the excitation in different directions are actually of different color, meaning that there are different excitations. And if I try to make it turn, uh, actually something will be deposited uh, at a corner. And for example, here I, I started having a red and blue, but once I turn, I'll have red and green. So at the corner, I'll have green and blue um, excitation left at the corner, meaning that this is not a quasi particle that you can just move it uh, in any direction you like. This is what actually we call a linear. Well, this is an, again, another name that we made up, meaning that quasi particle that only moves along a line. Um, somehow, for, for some intrinsic reason, uh, the quasi particles can be created in pairs, but then they only move along a line. Okay, this is one. Uh, the other type of excitation uh, are created by acting sigma z on a bunch of edges sticking out of a plane. So let's say we have sigma z on all of them, all of them. And then the excitation being created are associated with the cubes. They're the cube terms in the Hamiltonian, remember that? Uh, there are these cube terms in the Hamiltonian. If you do a bunch of Z, and then these are the terms that now have higher energy. So they're like corner excitations. And then notice that uh, these corner excitations are now made four at a time. So it's similar to the excitations in Haas code, where excitations are made four at a time. Uh, and because of that, uh, individually, each of them cannot move. You can try to create four at a time and then separate them at, as the corner of a rectangle, uh, but you can't just take one of them and move them away. And because of that, these are called uh, fracton excitations. So fracton in general refers to these set of models where quasi-particles don't move freely, but if it, the word is used to describe a particular excitation, it's referring to the excitation that individually don't move at all. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, good. So let me uh, try to summarize some of the key features of what we nowadays call fracton, or maybe you can say definition of fracton, but I wouldn't say it's a definition, it's more like a characterization of what people generally call fracton model. First of all, uh, there are fractional excitations with restricted motion. So it can be that um, in a three-dimensional space, in a three-dimensional model, uh, the, the fractional excitation moves along a line or it doesn't move at all, or it could move on a two-dimensional plane. And that also happens. Okay, sometimes the 
fractional excitation move on two-dimensional plane. And for example, in the previous case, if you have two fractons stacked together on top of each other like this, uh, that's actually what we call planar because that one can move in a two-dimensional plane. Okay, but in any case, uh, if it's not movement within the whole space, and we consider the fractional excitation to have restricted motion, and we'll call them either planon, linear, or fracton, depending on whether they can move in the two-dimensional subspace or one-dimensional subspace, or cannot move at all by themselves. Okay, and the second feature is subextensive ground state degeneracy. And this we have seen in both models where the ground state degeneracy scales as exponential in the linear size of the system. Um, like this. And for Haskell, of course, this is an upper bound while for uh, X cubed, this is uh, saturated. Um, and this is what we generally expect uh, for a fracton system. We can't have ground state degeneracy that goes much bigger. For example, if you have ground state degeneracy that scales as L squared or L cubed, um, I, well, I don't have a proof, but the general belief is that these are too big. Uh, that would indicate that you have some local degrees of freedom that you haven't get rid of. And once you get rid of the local degrees of freedom and have some ground state degeneracy that's truly uh, globally, that's, that's, that's truly global, uh, then the ground state degeneracy would be roughly uh, exponential in linear system size. Okay. And thirdly, uh, you have uh, uh, some uh, subleading entanglement behavior, but uh, I didn't get to talk about that. I uh, think I'm short on time, so I'll skip on that, but there's some subleading uh, entanglement terms. Um, so of course, I, this is not to say that one feature has to lead to the other. This is just some general observation that we have regarding a class of model which share um, all these properties. So, so whenever we see something like this, uh, we call them a fractal model. But of course, there could be outliers uh, which have only part of the features, but not the others. But so far, uh, among all the models we have seen, um, these these features all show up. Okay, uh, good. Any question? Okay, so let me uh, go on to give a, well, I'll give a quick overview of uh, what topics people are interested in uh, what approaches are being taken uh, to study these models. Um, so, so far, all the models that I've been talking about, their lattice model, and in particular, their uh, exactly solvable lattice model that people derive from quantum error correction codes. And there are actually earlier models uh, that uh, nowadays we consider them fracton, but at the time it was not. In particular, there's this uh, uh, Shimon's model. Back in, I think, 2005, so you see that it's much earlier, although at the time uh, it was called, not called fracton, it's called quantum glassiness or something. Um, but nowadays we consider them we actually consider Chavon's model as one of the type one model, type one fractal model, okay? So these are the uh, exactly solvable strong interacting uh, lattice model uh, that we can play with. On the other hand, um, under field theory, continuous model approaches to fractal. And actually, of course, the, the story predates uh, the word fracton, uh, where in general people consider higher rank gauge theories. Uh, 
and there were different motivation for doing that. And uh, um, part of the motivation is to study quantum gravity. And so this topic is also related to quantum gravity because gravity is a, uh, is a higher rank uh, gauge theory. So people were thinking about related to that and uh, not in the string theory context, but just you know, from a more, more maybe condensed matter perspective, uh, think about higher rank gauge theory as a toy model from a condensed matter perspective uh, in relation to uh, quantum gravity. And at the time, people were focused more on, for example, uh, graviton or the emergence of Lorentz invariant, things like that. Um, but, and then later on, when fracton comes up, um, it was realized that there are fracton hidden in these models all along. And, and this was pointed out more explicitly by Michael Preco. Um, and I, I can give you a very simple example, uh, and I find it highly il illustrating of this uh, uh, rank two gauge theory. So let's just say uh, U1 gauge theory, rank two in three plus one D. And usually if we have rank one, which is the normal U1 gauge theory that we talk about, um, we have electric field with one index where the index can be uh, X, Y, and Z. Right? Similarly, we have AI and AI is uh, X, Y, and Z. Oops, sorry. Okay, and in the usual rank one gauge theory, uh, we know the story. And the story is that uh, we have Gauss's law. Gauss's law said the divergence of um, the electric field is equal to charge and the charge integral. And because of that, we have uh, conservation of charge, right? Just because, because of Gauss's law, we have conservation of charge uh, in the usual gauge theory. But then when we go to rank two, when we go to rank two, we have electric field that's, that have two spatial index. So I and J equal X, Y, and Z. And similarly, we have A, I, J. Okay. Um, and when we say rank two, uh, that means we want I and J to be symmetric. Okay, so E, I, J equals E, J, I. So it's, it's actually the symmetric version of uh, higher rank gauge theory, not the uh, not the anti-symmetric. The anti-symmetric usually we call two form. Um, and because of that, the Gauss's law needs to be modified. Now instead of having just one spatial derivative, we have two spatial derivatives. Um, partial i, partial j, e i j is is equal to charge density, and because e i j is symmetric, so this is legitimate. Um, but then the corresponding conservation law changes. Well, we still have conservation of charge, but also we have conservation of dipole. And this is very important that not only charge is conserved, but dipole is also conserved. And that's why we have the charge as fractons because if you imagine a process where you create a positive charge and negative charge out of vacuum, just like that, this is not allowed because, well, charge is conserved in the process, but dipole is not. Dipole, there's a non-zero change in dipole in the process. So if we want to pop something, something out, out of the vacuum, we need to make sure that both charge and dipole, total charge, total dipole stay zero. So the, the minimum configuration that we can do is something like this. You have positive, negative, positive, negative. So you see that uh, this is a, a four body process uh, where excitation show up at the corner of a rectangle uh, and, and, and no two body process is available. So individually those charges 
um, they cannot move. So the charges become fractals, just like what we have seen uh, in, in the lattice model. Okay. So these um, gapped quasi-particle type excitation in uh, these higher rank gauge theories are actually fractals. Okay. And of course, people have developed this theory way beyond uh, this simple example where you can have all sorts of conservation laws. Um, um, but, but I think this, this very simple example just illustrates the idea of how in general, um, charge excitations in a higher rank of gauge theory uh, can be fractonic. Okay, of course, these models are gapless. There will be uh, gapless modes of photons uh, at low energy as compared to the lattice model, which have nothing at low energy. But for the gapped excitation, uh, they both show fractonic nature. Okay, uh, any question? No, okay, good. Okay, yeah, so I wanted to spend some time uh, just to introduce uh, you. Sorry, to... actually, can I, can I ask a, a small question on this? Sure. So like in, basically this is like a elastic theory type model, but can you actually show the ground state degeneracy of, of a model of this type? A ground state degeneracy of this type? Of this model? Yeah, so of, of this model. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I, I guess like the type, the, the previous type of the X cube model and the others, like you can, you don't have any continuous global symmetry, I mean, except translation and rotations, of course. But like in this case, like do you, I mean, do you have a, it's, it's kind of like a gapless and you, you have like, well, you know, you have a, a continuous global symmetry. So like, so I, I don't know, like whether can you, can you compute cross degeneracy of, of this, of this model? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I need to think more carefully about this, but since this is a gapless model, so people don't, <laughs> don't talk about ground state degeneracy that much and whether it's a, it's a, to, to what extent is it a robust ground state degeneracy? Um, yeah, um, I, I need to think more carefully about that. Whether so, but, but basically, but basically the reason this is called fracton is because well, the kind of the dislocation of the dipole can only move, sorry, not, not the dipole, like the, the charge cannot move by itself, but, but the dislocation can move essentially, right? Yes, I think you're referring to the duality to- uh, Yeah, so sorry, I mean, this disconnection cannot move, dislocation can move. Yes, quantum- So just, just like by that, by, by the, the first requirement that you call this fract point. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. It's, um, yeah, so, so the, yeah, um, the ground state degeneracy is a bit, tricky in this model. Um, but as you pointed out, I'm just using the, the feature that they're quite an excitation but don't quite move. And and, and a, a very important point that I, I, I didn't talk about is that this is dual to so-called quantum elasticity in two plus one dimension. So if you restrict to two plus one dimension, um, uh, then there's a duality to uh, quantum atoms, um, coupled to each other, basically a big um, quantum harmonic oscillator, coupled harmonic oscillator. And if you don't allow the addition of atoms or, or take away the atoms and just consider the elastic oscillation of the whole lattice, uh, then the fracton basically shows up as a defect in the lattice. And, uh, and if it's a disclination, it get, if it's a disclination, it gets stuck, it's a fractal. If it's a dislocation, it can move along a line. Yeah, thank you for pointing out that. That's a, I try to hide it <laughs> under the ground. <laughs> but if, but, yes, yes. Uh, Son told us in his talk yesterday that the, the lowest Landau level has, um, in addition to conservation of charge, conservation of dipole, as you've written there, and also conservation of the integral of rho x squared. Do you, is there any relationship to the lowest Landau level? And do you get the rho x squared conservation law? Oh, um, so so for this model, it's anisotropic, so um, uh, I don't think, but people have come up with uh, some anisotropic version of high rank gauge theory where you can have a, a anisotropic conservation law. I think Roca X square can also show up. It depends on how you design your theory. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't uh, attend the talk yesterday, so I'm not um, 
sure in which context um, um, someone's talking about that. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't think I can uh, comment on that, but, but it, it, it will be in different contexts because usually in fractional quantum hall, we don't consider the, uh, the excitation to have um, fractonic nature. They're deconfined quasi-particles. Well, you were thinking about the, 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 the new equals half uh, mm -hmm. confirmed liquid state. Um, okay, so okay. It, it may be I, see. Than... I see. I see. I, well, I, maybe this is related to what people talk about non commutative geometry and all that. But uh, sorry, I, at this point, I don't think I can uh, comment on that. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, um, right, okay. So, so uh, since I'm, I only have uh, 15 minutes, I'll try to just um, um, briefly touch on some point and then give you a taste of what we call foliation and then try to wrap it up. Um, so the other, there are of course, a lot of other activities uh, in the field and uh, something I want to mention in particular is the study, study of dynamics um, uh, in this model because these models have very different uh, dynamical uh, uh, properties, especially because the, um, the excitations get stuck and they don't move. And they're actually, um, so, so this whole study is related to uh, many body localization, glassy dynamics, and also I think it, uh, it's related to people studying um, uh, what's called, um, um, well, people consider, in, for example, in one dimensional chain uh, where you have both charge conservation and dipole conservation and, and there have been a lot of activities in, in, on that area and people observe something called Hilbert space fragmentation, fra Hilbert space shattering, basically the Hilbert space become segmented into exponentially sectors and that leads to non-thermal behavior as well. Um, so, so there's, a, yeah, so this is a, a very active direction uh, on fracton and it's not restricted to the, to the model I presented to you, it's actually much bigger, um, but um, I don't think I have time to, to, to say more than that. And uh, regarding the experimental realization, um, people have been uh, quite ingenious in coming up with uh, ways um, because the, the model I mentioned to you, uh, the Latin, lattice model especially, they're um, quite complicated and it's unimaginable that anybody would try to do a eight body or 12 body interaction, but um, there have been efforts, for example, trying to Sim, sim, simplify the lattice model to two-body interaction, uh, but still on a, on a more complicated geometry. Um, but it's progress, and then and then on uh, the the higher rank gauge theory, people have been trying to think about spin liquid, uh, which would potentially give rise to these um, modified conservation laws and modified gauge symmetries, uh, so that we might see some of the features like that. And and and. Also, there have been discussion on how to realize this uh, quantum elasticity in uh, electrical circuits uh, or um, as superfluid vortices. Superfluid vortices might potentially um, become, uh, give you fractal physics. And also uh, in whole doped antiferromagnets, basically if you restrict to some low energy subspace of antiferromagnets, the, the, the spin flip would, the whole, sorry, the whole, uh, would have some kind of uh, fractonic uh, dynamics. Um, so there have been a bunch of um, um, proposals and also proposal about how potentially you can measure them if there's a, such a system. And the, the most useful experimental signature I think would be um, more dynamical uh, nature. You wouldn't measure ground state degeneracy, but you can measure, for example, subdiffusive uh, dynamics and also people propose pinch points uh, in structural factor uh, that, uh, that can indicate the fractal nature of the system. Okay, so sorry, I just uh, very quickly uh, 
um, mention all these, but of course, if you want to uh, learn more details, I refer you to um, the review paper or maybe some more recent paper uh, on this topic. And just from the review paper, and uh, maybe you see who's working on this and, uh, and then go from there, sorry. Um, and that's because I do want to talk a little bit about uh, what we have been doing uh, in terms of so-called foliation structure. Um, so, right. So the, the foliation structure is, um, is our attempt to try to understand uh, fractal physics within the framework of phase and phase transition, because phase and phase transition is, well, the, the, the most fundamental idea in condensed matter that um, you don't just have random phenomena, but actually um, the phenomena can be grouped into phases, right? And this is the kind of understanding we would hope for uh, in fractal because so far, you see, so far, all I've been telling you is this model, that model, and, and they look kind of similar, but uh, also different uh, in, in many ways. So how do we even start to address questions like what kind of fracton order there is and what kind of fracton phase uh, there is? Um, it, 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 it's, it, it, it feels very weird because you're trying to paint a whole painting starting from uh, individual points, starting from very specific toy models. Um, but well, since we have not just one point, we have actually a handful of points. So we'll, what we did is try to connect these points and try to formulate something that's, uh, that's reasonable. Okay, so what we did is to, kind of formulate a notion of phase for some of the type one models. And it works for quite some of them, but we also know that there are models beyond uh, what we have, this foliation idea. And uh, right. So of course the most natural starting point is to say, well, we have the definition of topological order and topological, the, the, we have a notion of topological phase and that's well-defined. And we know what characterize topological order and topological phase. For example, ground state degeneracy on some non-trivial manifold uh, and the existence of anions of fractional excitation and their statistics. And all these we know that our statistics uh, are so-called universal property of the phase, right? So we don't have to uh, restrict ourselves to toy models. We can even go to um, more realistic um, models or even materials. And we can, if we can potentially measure these things, we can talk about um, organic material or Herbert Schmittite potentially being in uh, one of the topological order. Um, but for fractal model, it's, if we try to, oh, sorry, fractal model, if we try to directly apply uh, the idea of topological order, it doesn't seem to work. For example, the ground state degeneracy. Ground state degeneracy in a fractal model depends on system size. It goes something like this. So meaning that if we use ground state degeneracy as a, a quantum number that characterizes a phase, then the same model with different size will belong to different phase which is too much because, <laughs> because if we know if we have just the same model and then the bulk physics will be completely the same. But if you just have different system size, you wouldn't want to call them different phase. It means that the original definition of order and phase carries too much about the detail, cares too much about the detail of the fractal order. So it turns out that we actually have to redefine what is an order and what is a phase in order for it to make sense uh, for fractal model. And a, a very important realization is that if we simply have a 2D stack of let's say Tori code or any 2D topological order, 
And we already have a lot of feature of fractal. For example, the ground state degeneracy would be uh, some integer to the power of L because each topological layer would give you some finite ground state degeneracy. And when you stack them up, then naturally the ground state degeneracy will go exponentially with the number of layers. And also the quasi particle, they only moving in the layer, excuse me. They only move in the layer because um, because they're, they're, they're quasi particle in that 2D topological order and they cannot hop between the layers. And all these I'm talking about is stable to um, uh, small perturbation because the whole model is gapped, okay? But this we wouldn't call, usually we wouldn't consider it to be anything unusual just because we understand so well about 2D topological order and if you just stack it up, what's, what's so non-trivial about it? But now we think about it, this is already a kind of fracton, three-dimensional fracton order, right? Because it shares so many similarities, the ground state degeneracy, the quasi-particle restriction motion, and also the entanglement, which I didn't talk about, but the entanglement is also weird. So that motivated us to say that, well, maybe these features, since they already appear in a stack system, then maybe when we want to consider the fracton system, we want to mod out the contribution that come from layers. And if we can mod out the contribution coming from layers, maybe we can actually extract what's really special and what's really different about the 3D fracton order. Okay. So for example, the first thing we realize is that if you have an XQ model of a slightly smaller size compared to an XQ model of a slightly bigger size, they just differ in the Z direction by, by one, we know that they have different ground state degeneracy. So usually in a topological sense, we will say that they have different topological order. But now what we realize is that they actually differ just by a 2D target code. And we can show this very explicitly that we can just, just insert a, an extra decoupled layer of 2D target code into the SQ model. And then we do some local change of basis then the two sides look exactly the same. This is x cube. This is also x cube. Which means that if we allow the free insertion of two-dimensional layers, then uh, we can consider x cube model with different size as equivalent to each other, which is good because we don't want to consider X cube model with different size as different phases. Which means if we want to define the notion of fracton phase, we want to allow the free insertion of 2D layers. And that's what we did. So we define what's called a foliated fracton order. Meaning that if we have a system A, and the system B. And we want to ask if they are related to each other in the same phase. Usually we would say, oh, if you can deform Hamiltonian without hitting a singularity point, if everything's smooth, then they're in the same phase. But here we are actually allowing more. We're saying that if we can take A and uh, insert a bunch of layers in them, and then we can take B and insert some potentially different layers in them and different number of layers in them. And if after inserting these layers, they can be smoothly connected to each other, then we call them to have the same foliated huh. fractal order. So this is of course a completely different way, a new way to define topological order, uh, sorry, to define what is order and what is phase in a condensed matter system. And usually we don't do this because this is too dramatic. This is saying that all 2D topological order is kind of trivial. But for fractal order, we have to do this in order for things to make sense. Otherwise there's just too much detail. Okay. 
I think I'm running out of time. I managed to give you the gist of um, what 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 we call the, the foliated fracton order, and of and the the benefit of doing this is that we were able to uh, connect the dots, as I mentioned. So if this is fracton models, uh, there used to be a bunch of them, and what we were able to do is to well divide them up into <clears throat> let's say different phases, different foliated uh, fracton phases. So that gives us a much better understanding of um, beyond just uh, disconnected um, random models that we see as quantum error correction code. Okay. Of course, there are other outliers. And we know actually different species of them. Uh, and especially Haas code is one of them. Haas code doesn't belong here. It's a type two. Um, model, so has code is not uh, a foliated uh, order. It just shows that we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, extra, more work to do. Okay. All right, yeah, I think I'm, I've used up my time, but I'll be happy to address some quick questions. And then I guess on, on Thursday, I will have a, we'll have a, a question session. Thank you. Uh, any questions here? Uh, over time, but uh, certainly time for some. I actually have a question. It might be a quick one. Uh, so thanks for this really nice overview. In this foliated fracton order, uh, do you know what this is in the continuum case? So you had these tensor gauge theories. Um, could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, 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 great. Um, mm, yes. So, uh, so our definition does not directly apply Apply to to the tensor gauge theory I show you here because these are gapless. Uh, for gapless models, um, I don't even know uh, what's the full definition of of phase. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there are continuous versions of the gap model, and this is actually a large part of the work that I didn't mention by field theory people, especially by the group by uh, of uh, Natty Seiberg in IAS, and they get very interested in this topic, and they are. Um, because this is somehow something that uh, didn't fit nicely into the usual uh, field theory uh, framework, for example, the ground state degeneracy growth with system size and all that. Um, so they have done a lot of work uh, along the lines, trying to connect um, the models, um, especially the lattice gap models to field theory descriptions. So uh, I guess all I can say is that uh, refer you to their work. And they have also seen the, the their work and also the work by uh, Kevin Slagle and collaborators. Uh, I think they have been able to uh, um, also see the foliation structure. Um, okay. so by I'm, I'm aware of the fracton uh, order, but I, I was really asking about the foliation structure. So this, this foliated yeah. sort of point of view of that there is a continuum version of that. Yes. I. I think from my understanding is that they put a foliation field uh, as a background. Um, so in some sense you have, you know how many layers you have and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so they put a, a view button, or, sorry, I'm, I'm maybe mis misspeaking the name. Uh, yeah, so it's like you're going certain direction around a circle and you can count how many uh, um, layers you traverse mm -hmm. and then yeah, and then building on top of that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? So let's uh, thank the speaker. Thank you. Um, actually, is the, is the discussion session tomorrow or is it? On Thursday. Uh, I, some, yeah. I need to. Let me. Well, did I got it wrong? Let me see the schedule. Let me just check on everything. Yeah, I think it's uh, the day after tomorrow. Let me have one more question. Okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I got something. So, in any case, we'll have. Yeah, I'll, I'll. <laughs> to, to, to discuss. Uh, <laughs>
thank you again for especially thank you. this talk so early. Uh, I realized. Oh, no. Uh, no and uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for the lobby. We'll, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you uh, not tomorrow, then the day after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll see you.